What is up everyone, my name is Joseph and welcome back to Casually Competitive MTG where it's our goal to bring you semi-competitive EDH gameplay content that is both fast paced and entertaining. In today's video we do have two games, however the second game will have some different commanders and is a little bit of a special treat so stick around until after the first game to, to watch the second game, it's an interesting one for sure. Anyway, the first game today will be the last video that we'll be doing from the stream we did with Play to Win. If you haven't already, be sure to check them out. And if you want to watch games like this live, head on over to our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash casuallycompetitivemtg, where we stream twice a week. And after the quarantine season, we are planning on continuing the stream and start streaming our IRL or in-person recording days. So go ahead and follow that channel if you want to be updated when we're live. And other than that, if you want to help support the channel you have just a few days left to back the kickstarter to get a pre-order discount on our playmat so head on over to the link in the description for that we also have a merch store if you're interested in repping some casual competitive merch we have a patreon if you're interested in getting a few extra videos and some extra goodies throughout the month also in the description is a TCG affiliate link if you're looking to buy cards. After clicking on that link, any purchases you make directly help the channel at no cost to you. And finally, if you want to join our community and get to know us a little better, head on over to our Discord link also in the description. Now with that out of the way, let's get into the opening hands and deck introductions for game number one. Going first in this game is Bill playing his Corvold Food Chain list, where his goal is to generate infinite creature mana with Food Chain and Squee the Immortal in order to continually cast his commander, sacrificing Squee to draw his library and then winning through something like an impact tremors or a walking ballista with a side win con being a hulk line that involves Micaeus and walking ballista. Bill's opening hand contained a Grove of the Burn Willows, a Carplusion Forest, a Crystal Vein, a Skull Clamp, an Elves of Deep Shadow, a Blood Pet, and a Micaeus the Unhallowed. Going second is one of our guests from Play to Win, Dylan, and he was playing his Braylon and Shabra's Curiosity deck. The goal of this deck is to play Braylon, enchant her with a curiosity type effect, and then go to your end step with 8 or more cards in order to discard down to hand size, ping each opponent on that discard, and then draw a card from curiosity, looping this until his opponents have no life left. There are some side win cons with Underworld Breach and Lion's Eye Diamond and Wheel of Fortune. There's also a discard outlet in the form of Tireless Tribe, in case getting to 8 cards is a little too difficult. Dylan's opening hand contained a Flooded Strand, a Mana Confluence, a Steam Vents, a Sacred Foundry, a Ponder, a Dockside Extortionist, and a Mana Drain. Going third today is Adam, playing Yeast on the Wanderer Bard. Similar to other Yison decks, the goal of this deck is to activate Yison and then essentially chain through activations using something like a Quarion Ranger, a Wirewood Symbiote, or another untap effect to eventually assemble a creature-based combo that can generate him infinite mana or infinite ETBs, drawing his library with something like Regal Force, or pumping up his board with something like Crater Hoof Behemoth. Adam's opening hand contained three forests, a Sakura Tribe Scout, a Wirewood Symbiote, a Manglehorn, and a Tender Shoot Dryad. And finally, going last today is another one of our guests, Cameron, and he's playing his Chain Veil to Fairy deck. The goal of this deck is to play to Fairy, play the Chain Veil, and then have three other permanents that can untap for at least five mana. With these pieces, you can essentially infinitely activate to Fairy, generating as much mana as needed, and drawing your library. Cameron's opening hand contained a Mystic Sanctuary, an Ancient Tomb, an Inventor's Fair, a Dispel, a Cyclonic Rift, an Impulse, and a Gilded Lotus. Now with the opening hands and deck introductions out of the way, let's get into the gameplay. Bill starts off this game by drawing, playing a Carplusion Forest as his land for turn, and then tapping it, taking a damage, to cast an Elves of Deep Shadow. With nothing left, he gives the turn to Dylan. Dylan draws, plays a Mana Confluence, and then taps it, paying one life to generate a blue mana to cast a Ponder. He looks at the top three cards of his library, decides he wants to shuffle, so he shuffles and then draws a card, and then gives the turn to Adam. Adam draws, plays a Forest, and then taps that Forest to cast a Sakura Tribe Scout. With nothing left, he ships the turn over to Cam. Cam draws, plays a tapped Mystic Sanctuary as his land for turn, and then, with no other plays to make, gives the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, draws, plays a Grove of the Burn Willows as his land, and then taps his elves, taking one damage, to cast a Blood Pet. He then taps his Carplusion Forest for a Colorless to cast a Skull Clamp. With nothing left, he gives the turn to Dylan. Dylan untaps, draws, plays a Steam Vents as his land for turn, and pays two life to have it enter untapped. With nothing left, he ships the turn to Adam. Adam untaps, draws, plays a forest, and then taps that forest to cast a Carpet of Flowers. 
The carpet resolves, and he then taps the Sakura Tribe Scout to put a forest onto the battlefield. He then goes to his second main phase and targets Cameron to generate one green mana from his carpet of flowers. He uses the floating mana to help cast a Manglehorn. The Manglehorn resolves, and when it enters the battlefield, he has it target Skullclamp, and Skullclamp is destroyed. With nothing left, he gives the turn to Cam. Cam untaps, draws, plays an Inventor's Fair as his land for turn, and then gives the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, draws, plays a Crystal Vein as his land for turn, and then sacrifices this Crystal Vein and taps the rest of his mana, taking two total damage and gaining everyone else one life to cast his commander, Korvold the Fey Cursed King. In response to the Korvold cast, Dylan taps for two mana, paying one life to the Mana Confluence to cast a Mana Drain. The Mana Drain resolves, Korvold is countered, and Bill gives the turn to Dylan. Dylan untaps and in his upkeep, pays one life into his Mana Confluence to generate a white to cast an Enlightened Tutor. It resolves, and he searches a Curiosity to the top of his library. He then goes to his draw step, draws a Curiosity, and then at the beginning of his first main phase, adds five colorless mana to his mana pool from the Mana Drain. As his land for turn, he shocks in a Sacred Foundry, losing two life, and then taps the Sacred Foundry and uses three of the colorless floating to cast his commander, Braylon Skyshark Rider. Braylon resolves, and he then taps his Steam Vents to cast a Curiosity, targeting Braylon. There are no responses to the Curiosity, and with nothing left, Dylan gives the turn to Adam. Adam untaps, draws, and at the beginning of his first main phase, he adds one green from his Carpet of Flowers by targeting Cameron. He then taps three of his lands to cast his commander, Yisan the Wanderer Bard. Yisan resolves, and Adam then goes to combat and swings three total damage at Cameron. Cameron declares no blockers, takes the damage, and Adam goes to pass the turn. In his end step, Cam taps for two mana to cast an Impulse. He looks at the top four cards of his library, puts one into his hand and the rest on the bottom, and then goes to his turn. On his turn, he untaps, draws, plays an Ancient Tomb as his land for turn, and then for zero mana, casts a Mana Crypt. This Mana Crypt enters the battlefield tapped due to Manglehorn, and he then taps for more of his mana to cast a tapped Basalt Monolith. With nothing left, he gives the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, draws, plays a City of Brass as his land for turn, and then loses one life from the City of Brass to help cast an Imperial Recruiter. The Imperial Recruiter resolves, and when it enters the battlefield, Bill searches up a Walking Ballista to his hand. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Dylan. Dylan untaps, draws, plays a Flooded Strand as his land for turn, and then for three mana, casts a Wheel of Fortune. There are no responses to Wheel of Fortune, so everybody discards their hand and draws seven more. Dylan discards three, which means Braylon deals three damage to each of his opponents, and he draws an extra nine cards. Braylon also gets three counters on her, and then with all of these cards in his hand, Dylan goes to move to his end step, and nobody has any responses, so Dylan successfully goes to his cleanup step, discards down to hand size, dealing a damage to each of his opponents on each discard, and then drawing off of Curiosity, looping this until his opponents have no hit points, and he wins the game. Now this game may have been a short one, but it really does show how keeping a good opening hand and making sure your early game plays are as effective as possible can really change the outcome of a game. For example, I think Dylan played the early game really well, knowing to shuffle off the ponder because when he found the Enlightened Tutor either off of his draw for turn or for that ponder, he knew that all he really needed to do was let Bill ramp out and then hopefully successfully counter a Corvold to get the ramp he needed. If you noticed at the end of the game when he was showing his discards, he had a Pact of Negation and a Fierce Guardianship, meaning he had two free counter spells as backup, meaning that that shuffle, that decision to shuffle, was incredibly crucial for him to get the cards that he needed. Now granted, there was no interaction when he went to cast Wheel of Fortune, but if there was, there's a high probability that it would have resolved no matter what, because of how much gas and how much protection he had in his hand. Now outside of that, there's not much to say, because like I said, this was a very quick game, but regardless of the speed, I thought it was worth the slot and worth putting in a video. But that being said, I do think you're looking for a little bit more content today, so we have a very special game for the rest of this video. It's a game that I was hoping would never see the light of day, 
yet here it is. To preface this, this is a game that we took from our stream. And just in general, while we're quarantined and not able to meet up and plan things in a little bit more of a structured way, we do have to pull these games from our stream and use those for content. So bear with us. There may be some more of these little shorter games thrown in at the end. We're still exactly trying to figure out how we want to manage the content. Anyway, without any further ado, let's get into the opening hands and the deck introductions for game number two. Going first is Bill, and he's playing his Corvold list. It is a little bit older than the one in game one, but in general, it has the same win conditions and a lot of the same card selection. Bill's opening hand contained a Cinder Glade, a Wooded Foothills, a Mana Crypt, a Faithless Looting, a Vampiric Tutor, an Impact Tremors, and a Tainted Pact. Going second is Adam, and in this game he was playing Baral, Chief of Compliance. The goal of this deck is to just counter everything you can while looting through his library and trying to find the right cards he needs to win, the primary lines being a High Tide into an Enter the Infinite and then winning off a Thassa's Oracle, or an Isochron Scepter and Dramatic Reversal to generate infinite mana with enough mana rocks and then winning through a Blue Sun Zenith or a Stroke of Genius. Adam's opening hand contained two islands, a Gemstone Caverns, a Teleria West, a Mana Crypt, an Arcane Denial, and a Treasure Cruise. Going third is Joseph, playing a Turbo Thrasios or an Advantage Thrasios based deck. The goal of this deck is to play cards that get massive value or generate massive value with Thrasios, like a Training Grounds, a Biomancer's Familiar, a Zerda, really anything to generate a lot of mana and get as many activations as possible off of Thrasios, digging for a way to generate infinite mana, so something like a Freed from the Real Bloom Tender, or a Kinnon and Basalt Monolith to draw his library, and then winning through a Rolling Earthquake Angel's Grace, or a Finale of Devastation with some of this infinite mana, pumping up his board and swinging out. Now before I get into my opening hand, I want Want to warn you one thing that I like to do on stream is boundary test or push the limits or some may call it keep dumb hands and this is a good example of that I saw this opening seven it was my second seven but I saw these seven and I was like if I'm gonna try it I might as well try it on stream it makes for good content and people like making fun of me anyway so let's give them more fuel for that fire anyway my opening seven contains a mana crypt a paradise mantle a soul ring a Mox Amber, a Bloom Tender, a Doxite Extortionist, and a Ristic Study. The first ever Zero Land hand I think I've ever kept. Anyway, finally going last is Nate L, playing his Cranko Mob Boss deck, with the goal of this deck being to win off of a Cranko based combo, so something like a Staff of Domination, a Skirk Prospector, and a lot of Goblins to start, or a Mana Echoes and an Umbral Mantle, really just any way to get value off of Cranko's activations and then continually activate Cranko. There are other non Cranko based win lines, including some Kiki Jiki and Splinter Twin lines, in order to close out the game. Nate L's opening hand contained a Snow Covered Mountain, a Bloodstained Mire, a Hall of the Bandit Lord, a Faithless Looting, a Warren Instigator, a Splinter Twin, and a Kiki Jiki. Now with the opening hands out of the way, let's get into the gameplay. Adam has a pre-game action for this game, and he puts a Gemstone Caverns onto the battlefield, exiling a Treasure Cruise and putting a Luck Counter on it. Bill then goes to his turn, draws, plays a Wooded Foothills as his land for turn, and then cracks it paying one life to shock in a Blood Crypt, losing two more life. He then for zero mana casts a mana crypt. He then taps his blood crypt to cast a faithless looting. He draws two cards and then discards an Ashnod's altar and a cinder glade. With nothing left, he gives the turn to Adam. Adam draws, plays a tapped Teleria West as his land for turn, and then for zero mana, casts a Mana Crypt. He then taps his Mana Crypt, floating one colorless to help cast his commander, Baral, Chief of Compliance. With nothing left, he gives the turn to Joseph. Joseph draws, and for zero mana, casts a Mana Crypt. He then taps his Mana Crypt to cast a Soul Ring, floating one colorless mana. He then, for zero mana, casts a Paradise Mantle. He then, for zero mana, casts a Mox Amber. However, with all of these artifacts and no colored mana, he gives the turn to Nate. Nate draws, plays a Snow Covered Mountain as his land for turn, and then taps it to cast a Faithless Looting. He draws two cards and discards a Hall of the Bandit Lord and an Ashling's Prerogative, and with nothing left, ships the turn to Bill. Bill untaps and in his upkeep wins his Mana Crypt trigger, not taking any damage. He then plays a Tainted Wood as his land for turn, and with nothing left, gives the turn to Adam. Adam untaps and in his upkeep loses his Mana Crypt trigger, taking 3 damage. He then draws, plays an Island as his land for turn, and then taps for 5 mana to cast an Al Hammeret's Archive. The turn 2 Archive resolves, and Adam gives the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps and in his upkeep wins his Mana Crypt trigger, not taking any damage. He then draws and sighs deeply. 
He taps for three mana to cast a Basalt Monolith. With nothing left, he gives the turn to Nate. Nate untaps, draws, plays a Bloodstained Mire as his land for turn, and then cracks it, paying one life to search up a snow-covered mountain to the battlefield. He then taps for two mana to cast a Warren Instigator. With nothing left, he goes to pass the turn to Bill, and on Nate's end step, Bill taps for two mana to cast a Tainted Pact. There are no responses to Tainted Pact, and Bill exiles probably 95% of his library, and eventually, after exiling a Squee, decides to stop on a Soul Ring. He then goes to his turn, untaps, and in his upkeep, loses his Mana Crypt trigger, taking 3 damage. He then taps his Mana Crypt to cast a Soul Ring, floating 1 colorless mana, and he then plays an Exotic Orchard as his land for turn. He then, for 3 mana, casts a Food Chain. The Food Chain resolves, and he then uses 3 mana to cast Squee the Immortal from Exile. Squee resolves, and he then exiles Squee to Food Chain, generating 4 red creature mana. He then replays Squee for free from Exile again, exiles him again, and continues this until he has an infinite amount of red, black, and green mana, and he then, with Squee on the battlefield, casts his commander, Corvold. When Corvold enters the battlefield, he sacrifices Squee to draw a card. He then exiles his commander, replays Squee, replays his commander, and does this continually until he draws the few cards that are left in his library. He then, with some of this infinite mana, casts a Skirk Prospector. He then, for zero mana, casts a Chrome Mox, and when it enters the battlefield, he imprints Protean Hulk. He then exiles his commander as to not draw when he sacrifices the Skirk Prospector for red, and then taps the Chrome Mox for a green to cast an Impact Tremors. He can then continually cast Squee and deal damage every time it enters the battlefield, killing his opponents. So there's not much to say in terms of the win of this game because it was fairly clean and Fuchin is really good especially when there's no interaction so Bill did a good job of timing his spells correctly and waiting until Adam used all of his resources before trying to go off. However, I want to talk about my opening hand a little bit because, like I said, it was a very risky keep. Uh, zero land hand is generally not ideal, but for stream and for these kind of relaxed games, I do like keeping risky hands. I think it keeps myself a little bit more entertained, and I think it's a little bit more interesting, if not a little meme -y. Anyway, the reason I kept this hand is I did have access to colored mana if I could just get one source. In the list at the time, I ran 30 lands, so every time I drew, I had a fairly high chance of hitting mana. And it's not irrelevant that Mox Opal was also online with my opening hand, because that would have made it essentially just another land. I also knew that the other three decks at the table didn't play a lot of Artifact Hate in terms of Null Rod or Collector Oof, so I felt pretty safe that my stuff would at least be able to tap for mana if it didn't get destroyed, so really I was just banking on hitting a land early. And even if I didn't hit a land within the first turn, I felt pretty confident that I wouldn't be too behind if I drew one for turn two. Now, it was a bit of a risk, however, if I was able to hit one of those mana sources, I could have either played any of my creatures and then equipped Paradise Mantle to them in order to get access to any color, or played my Ristic Study, or played the Wheel of Fortune that I drew on turn one, so I had a lot of options. I felt pretty confident that if I could get one mana source, I'd be able to play Thrasios very soon after, and with Thrasios on the battlefield in all of this ramp, I knew I had access to multiple Thrasios activations per turn by the time he hit the battlefield, so I was kind of just relying on Adam controlling the board until I made it to that point. Now in hindsight, obviously the game didn't last that long, but these are the reasons that I like to keep these hands. I think they're spicy, I think they're risky, and when they pay off, they do feel exciting. Like I said, when we play these games on stream, it is more of a relaxed environment. We're not super cutthroat. We kind of just like to play cards and see what happens. So in those situations, I do like to keep these risky opening hands. It's not something that I would generally keep if we were recording a video or if we're recording specifically for a video, but on stream, it's a little bit more of a relaxed environment. Technically, this game did make it into a video, but it wasn't really our intention to start using these games as actual gameplay. And we have to kind of just use what we have. And I thought this is a game that's kind of not serious enough to throw at the end of another video for a little extra gameplay content without anything being too serious. If this is something that you like, let us know. And if it's something that you don't like, also let us know. Because we do have quite a few of these two to three turn games that didn't last very long, would make for a very short video that we could just throw in at the end of another maybe medium length video. So let us know what you think. That being said, that is all we have for this video. We hope you did enjoy it. I am Joseph. This is Casually Competitive MTG, and we will see you next time.